Hey booktube, it's Peg. Welcome back to the History Shelf. Um, my last video I had uh, some bookish plunder is what I called it and I guess with this video it could be more bookish plunder. Um, these are books I picked up along the way randomly here and there different places um, and uh, books that I have purchased. Um, it's an odd assortment, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Uh, there's no rhyme or reason, really. Um, we've got a few history, we've got some fiction, we've got some religion. Um, yeah, I don't even know. Let's just, just dive right in, shall we? Um, these two books, let's see here. I think I might have bought used. Yeah, I think I did. Well, you know, I love uh, reading about Russia, all things Russia, Russia, Russia. Well, Marsha, 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 Russia, Russia, Russia. And um, I came across this author named Jens Muling or Muling. And uh, I guess they're they're kind of travelogues in a sense, but nonfiction, kind of almost along the veins of like a Rebecca West's um, Black Lamb and Gray Falcon. Um, and there's two books here. The first one is called A Journey into Russia. Again, the name is Jens Muling. Um, and this is put out by uh, House, Pub House Publishing. So yeah, I definitely bought this uh, used, but it's in great condition. Um, and the second book I got, and this one's got Mylar covering, is used from a library, but I picked it up. It's, it's uh, Black Earth, A Journey Through Ukraine by Jens Muling. Um, so I wanted to have both of these. And they both just sounded, uh, like I said, you know, that kind of explore the area and, and it just reminded me of Rebecca West and, um, and these are both translated from German. Let's see, I'll give you, I'll read you a quick snippet of one of these just to give you a sense. Uh, when Jens Muling met Jury, or Yuri, a Russian TV producer selling stories about his homeland, he was mesmerized by what he heard. The real Russia was more unbelievable than anything that could be invented. Um, the encounter changed Muling's life, triggering a number of journeys to the Ukraine and deep into the Russian heartland on a quest for the stories of ordinary and extraordinary people. Away from the bright lights of Moscow, Muling meets and befriends a Dostoevskian cast of characters. A hermit from the taiga who has recently discovered there's a world beyond the woods. A Ukrainian Cossack who defaces the statue of Lenin in central Kiev. A priest who insists on returning to Chernobyl to preach to the stubborn few determined to remain in the exclusion zone. A journey into Russia is a revealing glimpse into the Russian soul. Um, yeah, doesn't that sound awesome? <laughs> I love it. Uh, people, I just find people fascinating. So um, just hearing about all these different types of people and their stories, it was like a, a no-brainer for me. I had to pick this up. Um, and then the journey, uh, Black Earth, a journey into Ukraine, um, tells the stories of the Ukrainians, of themselves, of nationalists and old communists, Crimean tatar, tar, Tartars and Cossacks, smugglers, archaeologists, and soldiers, all of whose views... Uh, could hardly be more different. Um, this is an unconventional and unfiltered view of Ukraine, a country at the crossroads of Europe and Asia. Um, let's see. Well, you know, Ukraine has a very um, bloody history. Um, and indeed, the, be the beginning of the, uh, the blurb here uh, quotes Bulgakov, who said, will anybody pay for the bloodshed? No, no one. Um, so wrote Bulgakov during the turmoil of the Russian Civil War. Since then, the borders of Ukraine have shifted constantly through conflict and occupation. The country has existed in its current form only since 1991, and its status and borders remain controversial, both among its own people and its neighbors to the east and west. Very true indeed. Um, so just uh, two fascinating books by Jens Muling on Russia and Ukraine. And uh, I was really happy to pick those up. Let's see. Um, and then I'll go into the, the big history titles that I have. Um, I think I've mentioned before. I know I have. 
on this channel that I belong to the History Book Club, which is a mail by order or order by mail book club where you can have, um, you know, you can purchase credits every month and uh, get first edition and uh, new releases uh, free with your credit. But, you know, your credit costs like seventeen fifty each, but still it's, it's way cheaper than a, a full price book. Um, so I really want, I seen this one was coming and I wanted to get this book to, uh, to go along with the first book I have by Alison Weir. And indeed this is book two. Um, I have the book behind me on the shelf. I'm going to grab it real quick just so I can show you. Okay. So the first book, book one of England's medieval Queens that Alison Weir <clears throat> put out is called Queens of the Conquest. Um, England's Medieval Queens, book one, it was put out by Ballantine, Ballantine Books, and uh, she just came out with book two, and this is, and so this is the one I picked up with my, with my history book credit, um, book club, book club credit, this is Queens of the Crusades, uh, England's Medieval Queens, book two, um, let's see, it's talking about the the Plantagenet Queens. Um, the second volume of Alison Weir's critically acclaimed history of the Queens of Medieval England depicts a period of high drama from 1154 to 1291. Years of chivalry and courtly love, dynastic ambition, conflict between church and throne, baronial wars, and the ruthless interplay between the rival monarchs of Britain and France. We see from a new perspective events such as the murder of Becket, Magna Carta and the birth of parliaments. So let's see who we cover here. Uh, Weir's narrative begins with the formidable Eleanor of Aquitaine, I love her, whose marriage to Henry II established a dynasty that ruled for over three centuries and created the most powerful empire in Western Christendom, but also sowed the seeds of some of the most destructive family conflicts in history and of the collapse under Eleanor's son, King John, of England's power in Europe. The lives of Eleanor's four successors were just as remarkable. Uh, Berengaria of Navarre, Queen of Richard the Lionheart, Isabella of Angoulême, I can't, Angu, Angoulême, uh, Queen of John, Eleanor of Provence, Queen of Henry III, and, and finally, Eleanor of Castile, the grasping but the beloved wife of Edward I. So, um, isn't that great? This is a great series that, that, that they're doing, that she's doing. Um, you know, Queens of the Conquest, which covered, sorry, I'm running out of room on my desk. I need a bigger desk. Maybe in the, the new house I'll have a newer, a bigger desk. Uh, yeah, Queens of the Conquest is the Norman, Norman Conquest, and it uh, goes from t t 1066 up until 1154 when this second book picks up. Um... Yeah, so I don't know if any of you guys have read the first one in the series, but um, the, the new one is out, Queen of the Crusades. Sorry for this being in the way. I'm trying to make sure the sound is good, but Queens of the Crusades. So that was one of the um, one of my uh, history book club selections. The next one is a brand new hefty, nice and heavy and thick and dense history of World War I. I love it. This is the Western Front. Oop, sorry about that. That's my phone. A History of the Great War, 1914 to 1918, and that is by Nick Lloyd. Look at that cover. Um, and this is put out by Live Right. Live Right. All right. It's nice and heavy and dense. Oh. Um, let's see here. I, you know, I can't get enough of reading about World War One, World War Two. So, when I saw there was a new, new book on the horizon of World War One, I, I was like, yes, please. So the Western Front evokes images of mud-spattered men in waterlogged trenches, shielded from artillery blasts and machine gun fire by a few feet of dirt. This iconic setting was the most critical arena of the Great War, a 400-mile zone stretching from Belgium to Switzerland where millions of Allied and German soldiers struggled during four years of almost continuous combat. It has persisted in our collective memory as a tragic waste of human life and a symbol of the horrors of industrialized warfare. 
In this epic narrative history, the first volume, oh, it's going to be a trilogy, you guys. Okay. The first volume and a groundbreaking trilogy on the Great War, acclaimed military historian Nick Lloyd, <clears throat> captures the horrific fighting on the Western Front, beginning with the surprise German invasion of Belgium in August 1914 and taking us through to the armistice of November 1918. Uh, drawing on French, British, German, and American sources, Lloyd creates a kaleidoscopic chronicle of the Marne, Passchendaele, Meuse-Argonne, and other crucial battles, which reverberated across Europe and the wider war. From the trenches, where men as young as 17 suffered and died, to the headquarters behind the lines where Generals Haig, Joffrey, Hindenburg, and Pershing developed their plans for battle, Lloyd gives us a view of the war both intimate and strategic putting us amid, this, amid this mud and smoke, while at the same time depict, depicting the larger stakes of every encounter. He shows us a dejected Kaiser Wilhelm II, soon to be eclipsed in power by his own generals, uh, lamenting the botched Schlieffen plan, French soldiers piling atop one another in the trenches of Verdun, British infantrymen wandering through the frozen wilderness in the days after the Battle of the Somme, and General Erich Ludendorff pursuing a ruthless policy of total war leading an 11th hour attack on Reims, even as his men succumbed to the Spanish flu. Um, as Lloyd reveals, far from a site of attrition and stalemate, uh, the Western Front was a simmering, dynamic, quote, cauldron of war, end quote, defined by extraordinary scientific and tactical innovation. It was on the Western Front that modern technologies, machine guns, mortars, grenades, and howitzers, were refined and developed into effective killing machines. It was on the Western Front that chemical warfare in the form of poison gas was first unleashed. And it was on the Western Front that tanks and aircraft were introduced, causing a dramatic shift away from 19th century bayonet tactics and toward modern combined arms, reinforced by heavy, ar heavy artillery that forever changed the face of battle. Uh, yeah. Brimming with vivid detail and insight, the Western Front is a work in the tradition of Barbara Tuckman and John Keegan, Rick, Rick Atkinson and Anthony Beaver, an authoritative portrait of modern warfare and its far-reaching human and historical consequences. Now that's saying a lot that they're ranking him up there with, okay, my phone needs to stop. Terribly sorry about that. Um, so... Gosh, Nick Lloyd, I don't think I've read any... Well, wait, I might have. Nick Lloyd is a reader in military and imperial history at King's College London and the author of four books on World War I, including 100 Days, I might have read that, and Passchendaele. Um, there's, our, there's our author. I'm oh, sorry, I can't, I don't have a good angle on that. Um, so this is a big, hefty work. Now, it says it's the first in a trilogy, but he's covering the entire war. So obviously, he's probably going to take it um, uh, looking at the different fronts, the different geographic areas. So, uh, yeah, this book is covering the Western Front, and I'm really excited to use my credit for it. Hello, Gidget. Can I help you? Yes. You want to come on camera? She might want to come on camera. Hang on. You want to come here? Come here. And then Boomer runs over. Little unscripted moment. Look at this girl. Oh, are you okay? Oh, baby. Look at this little girl. She's just shivering. She's wondering what her mama's doing. She's a good girl. Okay, go get in your bed. Little dog moment. I figured you guys, you know, hadn't seen the dogs in a while. Um, the next book I picked up, uh, I saw on another channel. <laughs> I get a lot of books from, uh, you know, looking at other people's books on booktube. So Vin over at Revenant Reads showed this book. And uh, I know it's dark and everything, but I've always been interested in this from a cultural standpoint and military like uh, militarily the the, uh, the tradition of this country and um, this is the the Knights of Bushido a history of Japanese war crimes during World War II by Lord Russell of Liverpool so 
Um, yeah, and I know he says in his, uh, he did read this and he says it's quite dark and you have to take it in bits and pieces, but I remember reading Flyboys and that really covered, um, this was several years ago when that book came out, many years ago actually, um, but it was a big, huge bestseller, but Flyboys talked about what they did to American prisoners of war when uh, Japanese forces um, captured them and it was horrific. Um, but they were also very cruel to their own people. They were not only cruel to other people, other nations, they were cruel to their own people. Um, the Japanese military was so severe, um, so severe. But, um, yeah, I, I think this covers a lot of different aspects of that. Uh, I won't go into it just because it is kind of dark and graphic, but... From a military standpoint, it does talk about that culture of Bushido and then um, having no sense of mercy or, uh, you know, how to treat prisoners, um, how, you know, how they just flouted the Geneva Conventions. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to me from a military standpoint and like just, you know, um, just how different the Japanese military back in that time was, um, and how it, how it evolved. So that's always been fascinating to me. So I picked this up. I picked this up on Amazon. This is put up by Sky Horse Publishing. All right. Another book that I got off of watching someone else's booktube channel was Johnny Keen. And he mentioned this, this, this is fiction and, uh, I can only find it in a mass market paperback, but and I think some of the other titles in this series are really hard to find. So I don't know how far I'm going to go with this. But he really raved about it. And then I read a description. I'm like, this is the kind of fiction I'd like to read. And this is Glittering Images by Susan Howitch. Or Howatch. Um, you know, this book came out in 1987. Um, but it... it, it it kind of centers around these people in this, uh, um, is it England? I, yes, it has to be. Um, it's about God, you know, sex, love, self-analysis, and forgiveness. I mean, it's set like in an Angl Anglican type of community of uh, people. They're dealing with adult issues, but yet there is a theme of like faith and religion running through it. Um, and so I was just, in the way he, Johnny Keane described it, you know, um, uh, it just made it sound really interesting. So, you know, I picked it up for eight bucks on Amazon, and uh, this is the first book in the series. And I guess it's, uh, it's called something, the Church of England series or something like that. Yes, uh, Church of England series. So, uh, yeah, set in England. It's all about people living in and among the, you know, each other, um, and, um, living in, by the strictures of the Church of England, and, you know, I, it just sounded interesting, like a really good English read, but that doesn't discount faith or religion, so I thought I picked, sorry about the technical difficulties, my recording just decided to stop recording, um, let's pick this up again, I found this book when I was going online, and I was looking at Ignatius Press publications, um, and, I know this was a big bestseller at the time, but anyway, I decided to check this out because I've been wanting a, a really good study on Jesus of Nazar Nazareth, but, you know, maybe from someone actually within the church. And this is actually a Catholic church, but um, this is uh, Pope Benedict XVI's Jesus of Nazareth, uh, um, Pope Benedict, otherwise known as Joseph Ratzinger. Um, this is the first in his trilogy. Now, I bought the second book on Ignatius Press, but I picked this one up uh, used because the, this, for, you know, the list price was a little too expensive on Ignatius. So anyway, I got a pretty decent used copy of this. Uh, in this bold, momentous work, the Pope, in his first book, written as Benedict XVI, seeks to salvage the person of Jesus from recent popular depictions and to restore Jesus' true identity as discovered in the Gospels. Through his brilliance as a theologian and his personal conviction as a believer, the Pope shares a rich, compelling flesh-and-blood portrait of Jesus and incites us to encounter face-to-face -face the central figure of the Christian faith. Um, 
and I just, I, you know, reading through it and reading some snippets, uh, this is just a, a nice, heady theological work. Um, it's not popular, a popular study. Um, it's, it's deep and it's meaty, and that's kind of what I want as a Christian. Um, and it doesn't bother me that it's the Pope. I mean, I am Protestant, technically. Well, Lutheran, I guess you could say. i kind of grown up in the Lutheran tradition. Um, but they say Lutherans are Catholic light. <laughs> uh, I'm not confirmed Lutheran, but I've always attended Lutheran churches for the most part. I, uh, I did go to a Presbyterian one for a while. Um, then I came back to Lutheran. And uh, yeah, that's an interesting story in itself. Uh, <laughs> if anyone's interested in hearing that sometime about why I decided to leave Presbyterian faith, um, I'll tell you. But, um, yeah, anyway, uh, I did order some books from Ignatius Press, which I, I'll show in another video. It wasn't a huge haul. It was like a few books. And one of them is the second book in the trilogy. Um, so, and then I bought a study guide that goes along with this because I really kind of want to take it in depth and not just, you know, read and then walk away. I kind of want to really meditate on the things that, um, you know, the Pope uh, Joseph Ratzinger was, uh, you know, diving into here. So, uh, yeah, so I picked that up used. It's a pretty good, you know, pickup for not too much money. Um, yeah, again, I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. We're going to try to splice this together and make it easy peasy. Um, okay, so the next three books I got, I just bought a three book uh, haul from Book Outlet. <laughs> That is so unusual. When I when I buy these books online at the bargain book websites, I usually get a ton of them. But this time, I just picked up three because they were low stock. I didn't have a super full cart, but I just said, you know what? I'm going to get these before they're gone. And one of them is actually, whoops, a New York Review of Books uh, classics, but it's in a hardcover. And it was marked down. And uh, it's a very slim volume, as you can see here. Back. This is by Ji Xinlin, The Cowshed, Memories of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Um, it's a little slim hardcover. Uh, it's like 188 pages with an appendix. Um, I'll read it to you. The Chinese Cultural Revolution began in 1966 and led to a 10-year-long reign of Maoist terror throughout China in which millions died or were sent to labor camps in the country or subjected to other forms of extreme discipline and humiliation. Ji Xinlan was one of them. The cowshed is Ji's harrowing account of his imprisonment in 1968 on the campus of uh, Peking University and his subsequent disillusionment with the cult of Mao. As the campus spirals into a political frenzy, G, a professor of Eastern languages, is persecuted by lecturers and students from his own department. His home is raided, his most treasured possessions are destroyed, and G himself must endure hours of humiliation at brutal struggle sessions. He is forced to construct a cowshed, a makeshift prison for intellectuals who were labeled class enemies, in which he is then housed with other former colleagues. His eyewitness account of this excruciating experience is full of sharp irony, empathy, and remarkable insights into a central event in Chinese history. Uh, in contemporary China, the Cultural Revolution remains a delicate topic, little discussed. But if a Chinese citizen has read one book on the subject, it is likely to be Ji's memoir. When The Cowshed was published in China in 1998, it quickly became a bestseller, uh, the Cultural Revolution had nearly disappeared from the collective memory. Prominent intellectuals rarely spoke openly about the revolution, and books on the subject were almost non-existent. By the time of Ji's death in 2009, little had changed, and despite its popularity, the cowshed remains one of the only testimonies of its kind. As Jia Jinying writes in the introduction, the book has sold well and stayed in print. But authorities also quietly took steps to restrict public discussion of the memoir, as its subject continues to be treated as sensitive. The present English edition, skillfully translated by Shen Xing Zheng, is hence a welcome, valuable addition to the small body of work in the genre. It makes an important contribution to our understanding of that period. 
uh, yeah, and you know that I'm, I'm always interested in reading about, you know, communism, the spread of communism, uh, the horrors of communism, uh, you know, I, only because it's it's something I, I revile and I, I, I detest. <laughs> and I don't want to see, you know, um, history repeat itself. Um, and it just, it killed millions upon tens and hundreds of millions. And, and Mao was probably actually far exceeded uh, Stalin uh, and Hitler. And just the amount of horror he unleashed on his people and the deaths. Um, so the cult between the um, the Great Leap Forward and then the Cultural Revolution, uh, they're they're just uh, grim grim milestones in the history of humanity, uh, highlighting man's inhumanity to man, and um, and how people would just go along with this and um, you know rat on their neighbors, rat on their professors, turn people in for you know having their own ideas. I mean, these things are frightening and we should be aware that history is replete with these examples if we would only go back to look and read and study that. So anyway, I came across this and I had never heard of the cow shed. Uh, I was immediately like, oh, yep, I've got to get this. So um, yeah, I don't know if it's still available, you guys, if you're interested on bookoutlet.com. But again, the author is Ji Xinlin. So if you just want to look or just type in the cow shed and see if, you know, if you want to get a copy. Um, it's probably going to be a very uh, engrossing read and very startling. Um, so the next two books are fiction. So we'll just lighten it up a bit before we end the uh, video. Um, so I've heard about this author from uh, several different booktubers and um, I'm always on the lookout for like good thriller or spy or espionage or detective novel and this is the first in in the series and it's a really nice penguin edition um and this is march violets by philip kerr and i think it's it's the series that first introduced or the first book that introduces bernie gunther um i'll read you a quick synopsis here uh, bernhard gunther is a private eye specializing in missing persons. And in Hitler's Berlin, he's never short of work. Winter, 1936. A man and his wife have been shot dead in their bed. The woman's father, a millionaire industrialist, wants justice and the priceless diamonds that disappeared along with his daughter's life. As Bernie follows the trail into the cesspit that is Nazi Germany, he's forced to confront a horrifying conspiracy, one that takes him to the very heart of government and eventually to Dachau. Uh, the first in the iconic Berlin Noir series, March Violets takes readers to the rotten heart of Nazi Berlin and introduces a private eye in the great tradition of Hammett and Chandler. Uh, so I was excited to find just a really, this is a an interesting addition. Uh, most of the uh, Philip Kerr books don't look like this. So um, yeah, I got this first song and it's the first in the, um, the, Bern, the Bern, Bernie Gunther series. So I picked that up. And I'd love to hear from anyone who has read any books in this series. These kind of books remind me of the books that I would see at my grandmother's house. Uh, she loved to read books that had like an Irish theme or an Irish, my grandmother's Irish, you know. Um, and, you know, I miss, and I miss her. I miss my grandparents. I miss my grandma. And, um, you know, she'd have these books around and she's always reading about the old country. And of course, you know, my partner is Irish, so... I got excited to see this and, and they just seem like feel good novels. There's nothing, you know, horrible or evil or grotesque or, <laughs> you know, they're just feel, they're just, co I guess you say cozy, I guess. But this is the first book in the series by Patrick Taylor and it's called An Irish Country Doctor, a novel. And it's the first book and I guess you get many books in this series. It's put up by Forge Press. Um, yeah, so An Irish Country Doctor is a charming and engrossing tale that will captivate readers from the very first page and leave them yearning to visit the Irish countryside of days gone by. And I really do yearn to go to Ireland with Martine and, and just to see her homeland and to see all the sights. I can't wait. So the book is about Barry Laverty, MB, um, can barely find the Northern Ireland village of 
Bally Bucklebo on a map when he first sets out to seek gainful employment there. But Barry jumps at the chance to secure a position as an assistant in a small rural practice, at least until he meets Dr. Fingal Flaherty O'Reilly. The older physician has his own way of doing things. At first, Barry can't decide if the pugnacious O'Reilly is the biggest charlatan he has ever met or the best teacher he could ever hope for. Through O'Reilly, Barry soon gets to know all of the village's col colorful and endearing residents and a host of other eccentric characters who make every day an education for the inexperienced young doctor. Bally Bucklebo is a long way from Belfast, and Barry is quick to discover that he still has a lot to learn about country life. But with pluck and compassion, and only the slightest touch of blarney, he will find out more about life and love than he ever imagined back, to, back in medical school. So doesn't that sound lovely? Uh, again, uh, the spine is beautiful. I think each book has a little picture on the spine like that. Um, so yeah, Patrick Taylor. Um, he's a, and Patrick Taylor is an MD, so he knows what, we see, what he's writing about here. I would love to know if you guys, any of you guys have read the series and what you think. Um, but yeah, there's so many books in this series and, you know, they all start with an Irish something, either Irish country village, an Irish country wedding, an Irish country Christmas, an Irish country village. But anyway, they had the first in the series and I said, let's go. Let's try this. Okay, so that's some more of the books that I've picked up along my way and my my journeys in the bookish world. Um, it's quite an eclectic, um, just random. They just would come in and I kind of set them aside to show you guys before I put them away. And uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. And I hope you guys are having a great Friday. And um, I hope to make a video again soon. We've got a lot going on here at the Casa. Getting new countertops in the kitchen soon. And uh, hopefully we'll be, we'll be putting this place up and listing it within the next four weeks. <laughs> Fingers crossed. And then we have to worry about finding a place because the market is insane trying to find a place. Um, but we can sell it, sell it very quickly. So yeah, um, again, I'm gonna keep making videos while I'm able. There's, there's gonna be a time where I'm gonna be so busy moving that it's gonna be radio silence. Um, but uh, just know that I'm here and I will be coming back. And I'll keep putting these up as long as I can. And uh, yeah, okay. Until next time, BookTube, have a great Friday. And uh, yeah, just have a great, you know what? I need a new sign off because, you know, <laughs> Bill brutenberg has got happy reading. And I, so I can't take that. Uh, but anyway, I hope you're doing well. Stay safe out there and we'll talk soon. Bye, BookTube.